Good, cool. Is that, we're good? We're good. Uh, is this on? This is on. Okay, so uh, I hope you guys had a good spring break. And uh, now that we're back, we're going to kind of pick up right in the middle of things and, and keep going from before. Uh, so remember that the focus of our last couple lectures has been in this Laplace operator. And hopefully I've managed to convince you that there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on by uh, just summing together second derivatives, right? And, and so to, to summarize our story so far, remember the Laplacian comes from the wave equation or, or the heat equation, if you've, you've taken physics class. Uh, and, and well, in 3D, you can write it as just the sum of the second derivatives of a function. On a surface, we had to do a lot more work, right? Because the surface is some curved object and you don't have second derivatives to be had in, in arbitrary directions anymore. Um, but we were able to derive a formula which isn't all that different. Uh, in fact, one thing you can check at home, which was going to be on your homework, but I thought it would be kind of mean, uh, is that if you take the exponential map of your surface, like you, you remember that's the thing that maps geodesic distance to a patch around a point. Um, that thing, if you pull back a function from the surface into the plane using the exponential map, then it's just the, the same Laplace operator that, that you're used to. Um, so that's a, there's a nice uh, property to be had. In fact, it's the unique one that, that has that property. Uh, but in any event, um, so, okay, so Laplacian operator has a lot of different interpretations. We're going to draw some more pictures of those later uh, today. Uh, and then the next problem that we had was how to actually compute the damn thing. Uh, and, and so we spent our last lecture developing uh, this idea from a first order finite element method, right, which essentially interprets functions as piecewise linear. Right? Remember, that means they're specified by one value per vertex that gets interpolated to the interior of a triangle in just kind of an affine fashion, right? just like in a straight line. Uh, and then by just doing lots and lots of, of, of high school trigonometry, we're able to go from this to some integrated version of the Laplace operator. So that's our, our story so far. Yeah? And that integrated Laplace operator is this thing called the cotangent Laplacian, which nobody can get right up to sign. So if your code is wrong, just flip the sign until it works. There's probably typos in the slides too. It's, 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 like, it's one of these things where, where the research papers in this discipline can't decide on the sign of this matrix because physicists and mathematicians disagree. And, uh, because we're an interdisciplinary field, what that means is none of us can decide. Uh, and, and there are papers where like midway through it like changes sign and nobody notices. And it's, it's really a problem. So to help you get used to reading this literature, <laughs> your homework likely contains similar mistakes. OK. Um, and these are things you're, you're welcome to ask about on, on Piazza, of course. OK. So uh, the one last uh, piece of cleanup we have from our last lecture was how to actually solve a Laplace equation at the end of the day. Um, so remember. Um, Laplace's equation says, like, maybe I have Laplace of f equals g, right? So as, as input, I'm given some function g, and my goal is to find a function f uh, that satisfies this relationship. By the way, do I have to make any assumptions on g for this thing to have a solution? I must vote yes. I must vote no. Let's try that again. You all have to vote something. How many of us vote that we need to put an assumption on, on G to solve this problem? All right, the yeses have it. So uh, in particular, uh, the Laplacian is a derivative operator, yeah? So what happens if F is like 17 everywhere on my surface? What is the Laplacian? Zero. What if F is negative one? What's the Laplacian? Zero. So this thing has a null space, right? There, there's, it's not a one-to-one -one map. And in fact, the null space is the constant functions, yeah? Um, and so, so in order for this problem to be well posed, um, you need that the integral of g is equal to uh, 0. Cool. OK, so anyway, once, once you assume that, then, then you're OK. Uh, and you can solve uh, Laplace equation. Uh, so the way that, how do we do it in a finite element method? Uh, well, we have to make a few assumptions. The first is, is how do we get g as input? Right? In particular, remember that we wrote g in this hat function basis, right? So we wrote g as maybe a bunch of coefficients times the hat function i, like that. Right? So we just expand it this way. And then we're still not in a great scenario, but like a common misconception about first order finite element is that this is it. And then you just solve for f, like just under this assumption. Here's the thing. Just because the Laplacian of f is, is a combination of hat functions, is f a combination of half functions? No, there's, there's no reason for that, right? Like, it, you know, Laplacian is a second derivative. If the second derivative of something is a line, <laughs> does the thing itself align? No, obviously not. Yep. So when we write f, we're approximating, right? I don't know, uh, 
we want to approximate f also in, in, in the hat basis, somehow we're in trouble here because we kind of know that we, we can't solve this, right? That if I actually invert the true Laplace of this, of this guy, I, I likely won't be able to find coefficients that agree with this story. Does that make sense? So what the Galler can find an element method does instead uh, is something slightly different. This is just review from, from last time, by the way. Um, which is to say, okay, uh, instead of that, I'm going to say, well, it, instead of solving Laplace of f equals g, I'm going to say that the integral against any test function, what's, our, what's a good letter for a test function? Phi. Uh, uh, Laplace f equals the integral of phi g. I mean, I haven't really done anything. <laughs> right? Certainly, the arrow goes this way. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and we know, by the way, how do we compute the... Uh, a matrices involved is we just integrated by parts here, right? This is really grad phi dot product of grad uh, f, yeah? But in any event, um, in, the, in the first order finite element method, what we do is we say, rather than assuming this is true for any choice of phi, I'm going to restrict phi to be in a subspace as well, right? In the span of these h's. And that's how I get my matrix system. Does that make sense? Right, so at the end of the day, um, what do I get? Well, I get that the integral of the gradient of every half function i against the gradient of f, which is uh, times the half function i, is equal to the integral of uh, g against a half function i. But then g, sorry, is the sum of a i times the half function i uh, times, uh, let's do it like that, <laughs> times the half function i. Yeah? <laughs> sorry. Oh, no, I did it here, too. <laughs> my apologies. Does that make sense? So, so in other words, uh, I did two things. I, I took both sides of my equation, I just integrated them against a test function, and then I'm going to assume that my test function isn't just an arbitrary thing, but is one of a finite number of test functions, namely these hats. That's all this happened. Yeah? And then this is just plugging in our ansatz, our assumption for the form of f and g, which we know is a little bit false, but approximate. Yeah? But when I do this, th this is just a linear system of equations. Remember, my unknowns are the, are the, the b's here. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and this is a square system, and in fact, is invertible. Yeah? And so that's the first order finite element method. It's just plugging in lots of finite stuff until I get to a matrix that I can cope with. Yeah? And so what do I need to do that? Well, notice that I can take this sum out of the integral. Yeah? And so on the left-hand side, I end up with a bunch of terms that look like you know, the gradient of half function i dot product of the gradient of half function j, right? And over here, we end up with a bunch of just hi times ah, hj, right? Those are, those are sort of the two ingredients that are hiding in these two integrals. And notice these are just matrices, right? This is just a matrix indexed by i and j. So for every pair of vertices, there's an associated pair of half functions. I take their gradients and I integrate them against each other. And what were these two things called? This first guy, the stiffness matrix, or Laplacian. People tend to call this thing the Laplacian matrix. It's not really true. It's kind of the integrated Laplacian, but whatever. And what is this thing called? Mass matrix. Yeah. Okay. And this is the finite element method in a nutshell. Um, there are obviously many things I can change here, right? The, uh, for instance, I could use a different basis for, for functions. Uh, if you wander into my graduate student's office, you'll see there's a big poster. It's super cute. It's called the Periodic Table of Finite Elements. And they show like, all the different bases you can put on a triangle based on like, co-location points. I'm like, really excited about that poster, but they didn't appreciate it nearly as much as, as I do. Um, you know, when I, when I started as a professor, I got to decorate the office and I put up that thing and like this elementary school geometry is cool poster and I think both of them went unnoticed by our graduate students. Uh, but, but in any event, um, yeah, so you have uh, uh, the cotangent Laplacian, which, which in general is this integral of the gradient of your test functions against each other, which could change if you choose a different basis. By the way, there are other bases that are non-local. You could put like cosines and sines there, for example, would be a Fourier kind of way to do it. Um, uh, and then uh, the mass matrix is the, the, the things against these. Okay. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the day, uh, to solve this thing, you end up with a bunch of linear systems that look uh, something like what I've shown you here, right? So L here is stiffness, A is mass, right? For Laplacian and area is the sort of geometry way to describe these objects. Uh, and then I have to invert L. And notice that L is a symmetric, positive, semi-definite matrix and sparse. It's like the nicest matrix you can have. 
By the way, that reminds me. Um, on your homework, if you have a single dense matrix, you will receive zero credit. Cool? Cool. And any dense n by n, like vertex by vertex matrix, if, 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 if I see one of those in your homework, or more precisely, if Sebastian sees one <laughs> of those in your homework, you will get no credit for the whole homework. Potentially for the whole course, I haven't decided. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and by the way, that includes implicitly, like if you take the inverse of a matrix and then multiply it by a vector, shame on you. Okay? So, so, so be careful. I'll, I'll check. Okay, so anyway, this allows you to do practical things like, you know, if you have a, a G is a, 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 you know, a step function on Homer Simpson, I can solve for F and it's some, I don't know, Simpson gradient function here. Okay. Uh, right, so there are many details missing here that you guys should go in and read. This is the very simple version of the story, a finite element method. I believe there are many courses here at MIT that just cover that for the whole semester. We do it in one lecture. Um, so this is mostly just a sketch um, because what we care about is not solving the, well, we do care about solving the PDE accurately, but sort of the aesthetic in this area is more to notice that this matrix L is extremely structured. Right, so typically if you take an FEM class, they'll just say, okay, this object is the stiffness matrix, so go use your favorite quadrature thing and just approximate this integral, I don't care what it is. But we went to a bunch of work in our last lecture to show that, in fact, this thing is, is, is hiding cotangents of angles in it. Uh, and, and, and that's really critical for us, right? Because what it tells us is we have one foot in smooth and one foot in discrete, right? On the one hand, we're solving smooth differential equation on the surface, like Laplace equation. On the other hand, we just have like trigonometry of triangles hiding inside of this object. Uh, and, and somehow we're operating both at the same time. Okay, um, another thing that we, we've pushed under the rug is uh, boundary condition. Uh, we did mention this when we derived the Laplace operator. Remember, when we saw the eigenvalue problem, we actually didn't have a boundary condition and we got one by accident, right? This was called the natural boundary condition that said that the, you know, the dot product of a gradient, the normal equals something, some, some value or another. Uh, and so essentially, you, to, to do that in finite element method, you kind of reverse engineer your, your boundary condition, right? Because you want to go back to the weak form. Uh, and, and this is like one of these things everybody gets wrong. And so rather than trying to explain it in class, I think all of the test, uh, all the test meshes that we have on our homework are going to just not have boundary. That's the nice thing about 3D stuff. Um, but if you do have surfaces that have sharp endpoints, you have to be quite careful about how you, you handle them. And it's a little bit application dependent. Okay, um, and of course this allows you to do many uh, things. You know, here's uh, eigenhomers, which are just the same thing, but now it's LF equals lambda times AF instead of, uh, you know, lambda times whatever. Uh, notice that I started counting my eigenvalues at two, right? This is lambda two. What is lambda one? Zero, right? The constant function. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can see uh, here uh, what they look like, right? And they, they indeed are kind of vibration mode looking, yeah? Uh, which is uh, what you would expect. Um, oh, and I included in the slides a link to this uh, periodic table of finite elements. Um, so essentially the way to think about this is like, in some sense our functions we specified as one value per vertex, but that was an engineering decision, right? That was just how we are thinking of functions on a triangulated surface. But like if I had more samples, like in the inside of a triangle, I could do better, right? But I'd have to decide on how to interpolate those to the rest of the surface. And so there's this really beautiful theory of finite element that essentially notices for every polynomial you could put on a triangle, there's like a natural set of collocation points where you could measure the value of your function and interpolate it and, and, and kind of have them all fit together. Right? So if you have quadratics instead of linear stuff, you end up needing a value at the midpoint of every edge. Uh, and it kind, of, it kind of works out combinatorially in a very nice way. So, and if you like this kind of stuff, you should like just download this table and just kind of stare at it. It's kind of, it's like a fun, it's a fun thing to look at. Uh, there's also a corresponding version of this for finite elements on grids. So, like if you have you know like a bilinear basis and you want to do stuff uh, that way. Or lately, uh, all the rage, at least in my research group, are these hexahedral meshes, and, and those are some extension of the guys on the right hand side. Okay, uh, one last thing that's worth noting before we talk about. Uh, applications is that sometimes you have completely unstructured objects and you still want their Laplace operators. We're actually later today going to talk about some applications in semi-supervised learning where you have high dimensional point clouds and, and those things have Laplace operators are going to use to move data around uh, between just abstract data points. Uh, in that case you don't have a nice manifold triangle mesh anymore uh, and there's a whole series of literature on how to compute Laplace operator in that regime. 
And it's quite tricky, right? Because you don't even know necessarily the dimensionality of the, the manifold that, that you have samples from, and, and yet you're trying to get access to its derivative operator. If you think about it, that's a really scary you know, task to have in front of you. Um, but there's some really beautiful work dating back to 2003. This is a very well-known uh, paper, and there's a lot of uh, follow-up on it, um, where essentially what they do is sort of the world's easiest Laplace operator, and then they show it's actually convergent, which is, which is surprising. Um, so what you do is you construct a matrix, which is just, so I'm given as input, like this torus here. I wish it would sit still for a second. And um, on the torus, what I do, right, so I have endpoints. I make an n by n matrix. And rather than putting cotangents, like I don't have cotangents anymore, there are no triangles. Yeah? I fill the entire matrix, I just, I take the distance between every pair of points and I plug that into a Gaussian. Yeah? And I think of that like a weighted graph Laplacian. So remember we talked about a graph Laplacian earlier, uh, two lectures ago? So I construct the graph Laplacian of this thing where your edge weights decay in distance. Okay? This is a dense Laplacian, this is a fully connected uh, matrix, if you like the, the parlance of, of deep learning. Yeah? Um, but the connections between faraway stuff are, are, is, is pretty much insignificant. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, and so what they show is if you take that to be your graph Laplacian, this is actually a convergent approximation of the Laplace operator of the underlying manifold, um, which is a little surprising. So in other words, like, as you densify your, your point sample here, uh, you, you get a better and better approximation without all this triangle mesh business that you need. Uh, and this works for high di higher dimensional objects as well. What do you think the catch is, just looking at these formulas? Sigma, Sigma exactly. Or in my formula, T, yeah? Um, there's a parameter here, which is the size of your, your Gaussian, and you have to choose that really carefully to get the convergence to hold. Um, because that thing, as you densify your point cloud, kind of stays the same size, right? And so there's, there's a little bit of a problem with that, right? And so if you really want that convergence result, you have to choose that T in such a way that it decays with the density of the point sample, uh, and uh, it has to be chosen with knowledge of the dimensionality of your, your manifold. Uh, to me, this is the big Achilles heel of a lot of this manifold learning research, uh, is that they say, suppose that my data is sampled from a manifold of dimension N, and then the rest of their paper is really elegant. Okay, so how do I know that? If I have a, a you know, I, I, I take a, a certain, you know, the blood pressure and, and height and weight of everybody in this class and I make that a point cloud, what dimension is that? Well, if I knew, I'd be 90% of the way towards solving my learning problem, yeah? Uh, and, and so there's a bit of a, a chicken and egg problem hiding there. Okay, so, what's our story so far? A, Laplace operator shows up just about everywhere. B, we can compute it. Now C is why the heck would we want to use it? <laughs> and that's the, uh, the topic of today. Next time we're going to step sideways and talk about vector fields a little bit, and then um, we'll probably return to this uh, next week. By the way, our next lecture will be... Um, oops, that's the end of our lecture. Uh, no, uh, our next lecture will be done by Ed uh, Chin, who's a postdoc in my group. Uh, he wanted to give a lecture, and so I gave him the one that I don't like to give. Okay, so... Uh, Right, so now we're going to talk about applications of Laplace operator. And the really amazing thing is that we've done all the hard work, which is setting up this, this matrix. Notice this is like a great example of the type of research we do in geometry processing a lot, where it's like 82% just deriving a nice formula, and then you just type it in and all these beautiful things happen, and you're just using like out-of-the-box linear algebra. I love this kind of research because I'm really bad at writing code. Um, and, and, and so let's, let's talk a little bit about why we're able to do that. So, if you remember our, our, our intuition all the way, what, two or three lectures ago, is that essentially we can learn a lot about a shape by just kind of hitting it with a hammer and observing the vibration modes, like the pattern of, of waviness and, and the, the frequencies of, of that surface. Can we learn everything? No, but we can learn a hell of a lot. Right? In fact, we know like, the cotangents of the interior angles of the triangles and so on. And there's actually like, a really beautiful thing that happens which is this is sort of right halfway between discrete and smooth, right? Like the Laplace operator really does encode a ton of, of the discrete geometry of a big pile of triangles, right? It's telling you all the interior angles of all of the triangles. At the same time, it's telling you something about the smooth shape that you attempted to discretize using that particular mesh, right? Because we, the first order of finite element method, its job in life is to simulate an actual vibrating bunny, not a bunny made out of a bunch of triangles. You notice how this is like kind of kind of cool. Like on the one hand, we're using smooth language, but on the other hand, we're still talking about like edge lengths and angles and things that, that happen discreetly, uh, and that those two things are kind of helping each other out. They play they play they play well uh, uh, with with one another. Yep. Uh, and so that's our, our job today is to talk about. Oops.
okay, uh, to talk about all, all the things that we can get from the vibration frequencies uh, and oscillating patterns. And, and, and essentially what we're going to see is that this one matrix is enough uh, to do all kinds of cool state-of-the-art pipelines in, in, in geometry processing. And I really do say state-of-the-art. I know that like all the vision students in the room suddenly tuned out because they think, oh, the deep network probably does better. This is an area where that is not true. Next year, that may not be the case anymore. Um, but as of now, actually, these techniques still uh, are, are state-of-the-art for, for many kind of shape retrieval style uh, tasks. Okay? Uh, and then the one additional key property of Laplace operator beyond all of the beautiful theory uh, is that in practice, it's just a sparse matrix. And that's the thing that like, you don't have to write code to deal with, right? There's just like MATLAB and Julia and whatever other stuff out there, Eigen. Um, to cope with these things on, on, on their own. So all the hard work is handled by uh, libraries that you don't have to write. All you have to do is type in that cotangent matrix. Hopefully I've, I've advertised this thing enough. Yeah? Uh, and, 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 you know, really the sparsity is just given by the, 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 the you know, adjacency structure of the mesh. By the way, what does that mean uh, for the Laplace operator, like that cotangent matrix? Uh, how many non-zeros per row, roughly? Seven, right? Because you have six neighbors and then there's one down the diagonal. Yeah. So this is a very sparse matrix. Again, if you do your homework, you use a dense matrix, then uh, get, you're, you're, you're dead to me. Okay. So our, 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 our next uh, task here is to talk about uh, discrete Laplace operators, uh, including kind of what they're good for, like some useful properties that we've already seen kind of go past, uh, and then talk about applications both in the low dimensional, high dimensional case. Cool. This is a fun lecture because it's just pictures. This is much easier to do than all this, this board business. Okay, so first uh, let's step back and talk about some of the properties just to kind of get your mind thinking about like, well, why do we go to all this work? I think one of the really nice things is that the Laplace operator is just one matrix, but it has many different interpretations, right? On the one hand, you can view it as a way to you know, if I have one number per vertex, either of a triangle mesh or a graph, to kind of compare that value to its neighbors. You can already see why this can be useful in graph theory, right? Like if I'm trying to understand propagation of information near in, in, in a network, sort of the difference between me and my neighbors is the thing that comes up a lot. And that's really all the Laplace operator is, right? We talked about the mean value property. It's basically saying that somehow the, the Laplace operator is really taking the average of your neighborhood, comparing it to the value at the center, and, and telling you whether those are similar or not. Yeah? Um, hiding inside a Laplace operator is also a measure of smoothness for, for functions, right? And so this can be useful for for problems that involve, you know, like, like regression and so on in machine learning, right? Because somehow in the absence of, of any other information about a function that I don't know, uh, maybe I just want it at least to be smooth, right? And so in computer graphics a lot we talk about interpolation, uh, and, and this is a great kind of context for, for that kind of machinery. Of course, it's also tied together with physics, and we're going to see some more of that today. Um, although I think if you actually used FEM to compute vibration modes and like, generated an audio clip with them, it would sound really terrible. I, I, my, my bet is that there's, I mean, physics is complicated, and, and this is a very simple model, and, and, and I, I think there's a lot in between. Uh, and then there's one final observation in the discrete case, which is that this matrix, in addition to coming from partial differential equation and having all these nice interpretations in terms of harmonic functions, also just tells you things about triangle edge, uh, angles and, and, and areas, yeah? Like, it's, it's just hiding inside of this matrix. In fact, if I want to reconstruct a triangle in, in my mesh, if, I, if you give me those two matrices, I can. Do you see that? Because I have the cotangents of the three angles of the triangle. So in effect, I have the three angles of the triangle. And I have their area from the mass matrix, so I can kill that scale factor from the three angles. So those two matrices together actually do give the, the mesh up to rigid motion. Uh, in fact, there are many, 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 many formulas for cotangent Laplacian. We derive the most common one. Another one, which conveniently, of course, is, is in one of my own papers, uh, it, it really exposes that, that it's just edge lengths and areas. So here, uh, L is the, just the same cotangent Laplace matrix. And you can actually write it in terms of like the lengths of assorted edges squared divided by the areas of the, the two triangles that they, they share. That's not all that surprising, right? This is just kind of reverse engineering the proof that we, we did in class. Okay. What doesn't appear <laughs> in this formula? Vertex position. This is purely intrinsic. Do you see that? So, so uh, in, in, in particular, uh, let's say I take these two triangles and I make them out of popsicle sticks or rods or whatever. And all I do is I specify the lengths of the edges, right? That's effectively what I get out of the Laplace operator. Does that tell me the shape? 
in 3D? No, I mean, for one thing, I could slide it around. That's, that's kind of boring, though. Um, but I could also take those two triangles that share an edge, and I could just hinge them like that, and you get the same Laplace operator. Yeah? Uh, and all that is to say that the uh, Laplace operator is invariant to isometry, which is bending without stretching. Yeah? And if you read the literature in computer graphics, you'll see that people are really focused on this, pro this property that they want, I I isometry invariant algorithms for geometry processing. And, and sort of the intuition, which we'll, we'll come back to in a moment, is that like, well, a lot of the things around us really do deform nearly isometrically, right? I mean, mechanical parts deform exactly isometrically, they're just moving rigidly. Yeah? But the other really key application is like humans, you know, we're filled with bones. Yeah, and so as you deform, for the most part, you're just a big assemblage of rigid pieces that are moving around, right? And so human bodies deform in a nearly isometric fashion, right? which means that like, if I want to analyze shape, but I don't care what pose I'm in, like I just want to tell myself apart from Magnus, I know it's hard to do. One way to do that is to compute the Laplace operator and comparing their, their eigenvalues. And even though Magnus and I, like I might be doing the Macarena and he might be doing whatever it is that kids dance to these days, uh, uh, it, it won't matter because the, the dominant information in, in that spectrum is, is the person's identity. It's not the, the pose they're in. Yeah? At the same time, this reveals a big problem with a lot of this literature, which is let's say I have a big database and I don't care who is doing the Macarena? I just want all of the people in that same pose. Do you think these algorithms are particularly useful for that task? No, because somehow they're insensitive to that kind of motion. Yeah? There's a little bit of an assumption that's hiding in these papers uh, that I think isn't always carried out. Okay, so, so let's talk about isometry for a minute. Um, there are a lot of different definitions of the term isometry. They're all equivalent-ish. Um, so the, the, the most common one is that you have two different spaces and you have a map from one into the other that just preserves the distance function then I think we can all agree that they're the same. If I took the derivative of that map, it would kind of locally look like an identity matrix. Do you see that? Because like nothing stretches or, or, or shrinks. Um, so a local isometry is one for which I can kind of pull back the metric from one thing onto another uh, and, and nothing interesting changes. Uh, by the way, does anybody know the definition of a conformal map? Yeah. Angle preserving, yeah. And so in that case, I get to put a scalar uh, out, out here. Um, conformal maps will show up uh, a little bit later. Okay, so, so intrinsic algorithms, um, the basic point is that there are a lot of stuff out there that, that, that bends kind of intrinsically. Uh, a different way to think about it, which I've decided to illustrate in crochet uh, fashion here, is that intrinsic geometry is all the geometry you can sense as an ant crawling around on a surface, right? So if you're an ant with a piece of string, maybe, and then, then, then you can measure distance, but you can't measure distance normal to the surface, right? You're attached to this thing. Uh, and, and, and so somehow an ant also can't easily tell what pose you're in. Yeah? I guess it can if you bend and you squash it, but that, that's a, a, a different matter. Yeah? Okay, so, so that was really the hope, and for I would say maybe 15, 20 years, all of us in geometry processing were really excited because somehow isometry invariants led to these algorithms which were insensitive to all these different poses of, of people or emoji or whatever. Um, the reality is, how many surfaces out there bend isometrically? Anybody know? Like if I, if I hand you a, a surface, I just pick up one, well, actually, that's a bad example. I, I, pick, <laughs> I pick up a surface that isn't my nice flat laptop, and I hand it to you. What is, what is the probability that that thing admits any isometric deformation at all? Zero. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so the reality is that, although this was the hope, um, um, really, if you, if you have an isometry invariant algorithm, it's just very good at, at, at origami. <laughs> uh, in fact, one thing you can show is that the only surfaces that, well, not the only surfaces, but the, the most common surfaces that emit isometric deformation uh, just have zero intrinsic curvature. They're just, they're just flat. Yeah? Uh, and, and so really what's going on here is that um, few surfaces can deform isometrically. There's some beautiful examples. By the way, if you're into uh, like origami and developable surfaces, uh, uh, you know, of course, Eric Domain in our own department has a very different perspective on, on this uh, set of, of, of problems. Um, but uh, in, in our case, we're not concerned with just building stuff out of paper, but also things that are nearly isometric. And that's what's really interesting here, is that there are many spaces out there which are nearly isometric when they deform, but not 100%. Yeah? Uh, and, and actually, an, a great open problem that, that, that people study in this area is, is sort of what is the deviation? Like, like for instance, for a human, 
can I think of you as, as nearly asymmetrically deforming? If you bend your elbows, your arms, your shoulders, it's unclear. What does is, what is near mean? <laughs> uh, is, is, is kind of a suspect question here. Uh, so, so anyway, that, that was the, sort of the inspiration behind a lot of these techniques. Um, another one uh, which uh, it was, was sort of highlighted in this, this paper in 2012 um, is actually that if you know, and this is actually something that, that is surprising um, and a little bit troubling <laughs> about our, 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 our theory here. Remember we've talked about no free lunch and that sometimes discrete stuff and smooth stuff just don't agree? This is a great example. So. Um, in the smooth case, the Laplace operator does not give you anything rigid at all. Right? In fact, um, one thing you can prove is that essentially the Laplacian measures angles in the smooth case. It knows about conformal structure. Um, and you can kind of see that in our cotangent Laplacian because it has cotangents. Those are angles. There's no length in there. But there's a really weird property of the cotangent function, uh, which is that you can actually recover. Uh, they call it the discrete Riemannian metric. I call it edge lengths. Um, that if you have the Laplace operator, you actually know all of the edge lengths of your triangle mesh just up to one global scale factor. This is troubling because you shouldn't be able to do this from, from one uh, Laplace operator. Uh, so th there's something a little bit fishy hiding here. By the way, if you guys are looking for a very challenging read for your reading assignment, do next week, I believe. This is a great paper uh, to do that. Uh, I've never made it to the end. OK, uh, which makes me suspicious. But. Don't, don't tell the authors. Okay, uh, there's one additional uh, uh, caveat that we should talk about before just having like a big petting zoo of, of, of fun uh, Laplacian applications. Uh, this is actually a motivator for a lot of my own research, so I'm morally obligated to communicate it to all of you guys. Um, a lot of the surfaces that I've rendered for you guys are, are what people in computer-aided design would call uh, uh, boundary representation, right? They call them B-reps. Why are they called boundary representation? Because they have stuff inside of them, right? Like when you have a CAD model of like gears, right? I mean, the, the gears look like a two-dimensional surface, but if I 3D printed it, I wouldn't just print like a thin shell, right? I would, I would print a volume full of stuff. Yeah? And the geometry of those two objects is actually quite different from one another, right? Like, so for instance, if I have a really wide, you know, ellipsoid, yeah? Then intrinsically, like from the ant's perspective, like here's my ant. Right? This point and this point are quite far apart. Right? The ant has to go all the way there. Whereas if this thing has meat inside of it, then the ant can just cut right down the middle. Yeah? And so uh, in terms of, like for instance, we're talking about nearly isometric deformation. A nearly isometric deformation of this ellipsoid would be a circle. Right? I could just inflate it, and the surface actually doesn't change all that much. Yeah? But the volume inside changes a ton. Yeah? Uh, and so an, uh, yet another caveat to keep in mind, I really love this figure. It's from, from a paper in, in 2010 by, by Dan Raviv. Most of our geometry processing algorithms are not really processing your hand, even if that's what we're rendering. They're, they're, they're processing a rubber glove. And those two things deform in very different ways. I guess it's kind of a negative lecture. I'm spending all of my time telling you everything wrong with these algorithms before telling you what they are. But in any event, the reasons to study this operator is that the, they, they do encode, and when I say encode, I really mean it. You can read off edge links, uh, the, the intrinsic geometry of a mesh, uh, and though there's some link to the smooth theory as well. Another reason people like it is it's a kind of multi-scale. Like if I write things in terms of Laplacian eigenfunctions, the first few eigenvalues are kind of sensitive to big stuff, and then as I get farther out, they're sensitive to small details. Right? Um, you get to do geometry using linear algebra, so you don't have to write any finicky computational geometry code. It's just you know, backslash and MATLAB. Uh, and there's some, some nice connection to physics. So there's some, some good intuition to be had, uh, despite the, the teasing that I, I give the physicists in this class. OK, so, so to continue in our outline for the day, uh, essentially what I wanted to highlight in the first little part was just that there's a lot of stuff hiding in this one matrix. Uh, and and, and, and that there's, that's really the reason why it's a whole cottage industry worth of, of research papers and, and algorithms, techniques out there that, that use it. Now let's talk about a lot of different applications of this thing. The great thing is these are all about five lines of code uh, beyond uh, implementing Laplace matrix. Okay, so it's a very simple one. Um, let's, let's talk about shape descriptors for a second. So the position of a vertex on a mesh is not a particularly good way to describe the role of that vertex in the mesh geometry. Right? In particular, if I take that vertex, uh, take the mesh and rotate it 20 degrees, then all of the vertices moved. Yeah, so like it's just a long list of vertex positions. It's like not a very good way to describe the interesting part of, of your mesh. Uh, 
Uh, and so a very typical task, um, in, in, in geometry they call them descriptors, in machine learning they call them features. Um, they're exactly the same, it's just to come up with a big vector of numbers per point on a surface that kind of distinguishes that point from all the other ones. Yeah? Or a kind of related task would be I have two different surfaces and I want a feature so that like the same point on the two surfaces agrees. Yeah? Um, we've already talked about some features in this class. Can you guys name some of we had like back in week two or three? Curvature, right? Because remember, Gaussian and mean curvature are two perfectly reasonable features for, for points on a surface. Uh, in fact, they roughly describe all the interesting geometry, right? And the great thing about Gaussian mean curvature is if I take a surface and rotate it, what happens to the Gaussian mean curvature? Nothing, right? And so th that would probably be a better way to, to match one surface to another than trying to match vertex positions, which is, which is a, kind of a tricky matter. Does that make sense? What are the problems with Gaussian and mean curvature? Why, why, why not stop there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, how we went over how uh, you, there's multiple ways to discretize Gaussian. Yeah, there are many different ways to compute them. Any other ideas? What's, what goes wrong? Yeah. I mean, could you have points on, at very different places on the mesh that have similar curvature? Absolutely. I could have a mesh with two different spherical pieces that both have exactly the same curvature, or hyperbolic, or whatever. Any other problems? Curvature is the second derivative. What do we know from Fourier theory about what happens when I when I take derivatives? It amplifies noise. Yeah, curvatures tend to be extremely noisy. Uh, so there's there's a whole community of people out there that work very hard to engineer different descriptors for points, uh, and they tend to need sort of one foot in application area, like to kind of know the type of shape that they care about. Um, then another in, in 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 geometry and math. And these days, a third one probably in in in, in machine learning. Okay, so, so there are many different tasks uh, for descriptors. One is to kind of just describe the, the geometry around a point, kind of understand how one point differs from another. Um, a different way of, of kind of understanding that is that I kind of want to describe the role of a point on a surface. Right? Like the tip of the ears of the bunny is quite different from his nose, and, and that's what's going to allow me to match one bunny to another. Yeah? Uh, so, so we've already seen uh, descriptors, right? Like here's Gaussian and mean curvature, our, our two favorites. In fact, I think you, you computed them on your homework. Um, but if we step back uh, 10 feet, there are a lot of different properties you might want for, for a descriptor function or a feature, whatever you want to call it. Yeah? Um, one is that they distinguish points. So let's say that I'm really worried about stability of my feature. What's a good feature that's extremely stable? Zero. <laughs> yeah? If I label every point with zero, then as I deform, it's, you know, it's isometry invariant, um, the number zero. Uh, right, uh, but so, so, you know, on the one hand I want to distinguish points from one another, but on the other hand I'd like it to be stable, right? And so there's some push-pull between those two things. Uh, and then another one which you see a lot is that sort of it's often desirable to have intrinsic features because sort of they're, they're, they're stable to certain types of deformation that you often want to quotient out. But this third one is debatable and it really depends on the, the application you care about. Yeah? Um, so, so a typical word that you see in, in this little branch of geometry literature is, is the word invariant. Right? They want their, their, their features to be invariant under certain motions or certain deformations and so on because that way you know if UA is dancing and I'm taking a walk we can still match the hands to the hands and the, the nose to the nose, whatever. That makes sense? Okay. Right, and, and, and we actually have an example of an intrinsic descriptor, right? So remember, so intrinsic means this isometry invariant. What's a good intrinsic descriptor of a point on a surface? You kill me. Okay, so we only have two curvatures, so, so flip a coin. Let's, let's choose one. I got all day. Gaussian curvature, thank you, fabulous. So remember, uh, uh, there's a Gauss's theorem tells us that Gaussian curvature is intrinsic quantity. It's actually completely measurable just in terms of geodesic distance. Yeah? Um, it has this Latin name, which is roughly totally awesome theorem. Uh, and this is typically, I think, what you prove in your, your, the, the first half of your undergrad differential geometry course. And the second half is gauss benet theorem. Okay. Um, the question is like, well, that's it. If we want a geometry invariant feature, there, there it is. We're done. Um, but of course, there's many challenges, like we mentioned. It's noisy, for one. And for another, I mean, this is one feature, but I'm on a 2D surface, yeah? So if I project into a feature space, I clearly can't project back. You know? Um, so if I'm looking for, for mappings, I, I haven't found it yet. I need at least two features. Probably more. 
Uh, yeah, and so in fact, uh, like here's a typical problem. There's a model. This is actually a figure from one of my old papers, uh, and you can see that, that this estimate of curvature is extremely noisy, right? Like it's somehow viewing this little vertex sitting in the middle of a flat piece of the surface as ever so slightly hyperbolic. Or, uh, like the, there's a lot of issues with curvature. Um, another probably larger issue is, of course, like the entire top of the car looks the same uh, with, with respect to this kind of measure. Yeah? Okay. So the typical things that, that people use uh, in, in, in this area are that you want to kind of incorporate some local neighborhood information and that it's stable under deformation. I think we've, we've repeated that a number of times. One intuition that people use uh, to construct some really cool descriptors, or hot descriptors, uh, is, is to use the, the heat equation on a surface. So we talked about the wave equation. Remember, wave equation is second derivative of u equals uh, minus Laplacian. The heat equation, you just pop off a derivative on the left-hand side. <laughs> Uh, and this describes diffusion of heat. So if I have U at time zero and it evolves under this PDE here, this tells me how the heat diffuses along a surface. And there's this really beautiful observation that people made in modern differential geometry, um, which is that heat diffusion and curvature are intricately linked together. Yeah? Have, uh, have you guys thought about this too much? I mean, remember, there are a lot of different ways of thinking about curvature. Uh, the one that I prefer these days is that, like, if you have negative curvature or hyperbolic, then somehow you have too much perimeter for your area. Does that make sense? Like, if you have a potato chip, somehow the reason the potato chip has the shape is because it has, like, a really long boundary, but, like, there's not that much surface area enclosed inside of that boundary, and, and, and the other way for a sphere. So uh, think about that in terms of heat diffusion, or equivalently in terms of, like, a random walker. Uh, it turns out those are the same. Right, so like I have some little particle of heat, right, some, some, and, and it wants to diffuse outward. If I'm on a hyperbolic surface, there's a lot of places for the heat to go, right? And so, right, if you think of the heat as kind of a bunch of concentric circles, pretty soon it's amortized over these big loops, right? So it diffuses pretty slowly. Whereas on a positively curved surface like a sphere, heat diffuses very fast, right? It can get pretty far. And, and that intuition actually bears itself out. So if you, if you look at the heat equation, and you put a little pinprick of heat at different points on the surface, and you just measure how much heat is left as a function of time, that function tells you an awful lot about the geometry of your surface on different scales. So a really clever observation. Uh, and, and, and so at the same time, this is, effect, so this is affected by curvature, uh, but this PDE, oops, ah, why is my laptop doing that? is, is uh, intrinsic, meaning that if I bend the surface, because the surface is made out of tinfoil, there's no meat in the inside, uh, the, the heat diffusion doesn't change. No. And so based on that intuition, there's a whole sequence of uh, point descriptors that people uh, cooked up that are extremely effective for matching between isometric or nearly isometric uh, surfaces. And this continues to be used. I was just reviewing SIGGRAPH papers, and, and, and there's plenty there. Um, so I think the first uh, common one geometry community was in 20, uh, 2007. It was the GPS, or Global Point Signature. Uh, and, and this is extremely simple. So essentially, what you do is you compute all the eigenfunctions of the Laplace, and that's these phi's here. Yeah? And I can associate to every point on my surface... Now, this, this is going to require some flipping of the way that we think about it. So our geometry now is going to be, for a single point, we're going to embed that point into some other space, which is its descriptor vector. So a simple descriptor vector would be, I just take all of the eigenfunctions, maybe normalized to integrate to one, and I just read off their value at that point. Right? Uh, and, and the GPS is more or less that. Uh, they propose scaling it by uh, one over the eigenvalue. Um, why might you want to do that, by the way? What happens as I go farther to the right here? Let's say I sort from the smallest eigenvalue to, to the biggest. Well, the eigenfunctions get more and more wiggly. <laughs> yeah, they get less and less stable. Uh, and, and, and so it makes some sense to wait by something that looks like one over the eigenvalue to kind of downweight the, the stuff that's, that's going to be noisy. Uh, in fact, if you get far enough out on the spectrum, you're just seeing discretization artifact, right? Because maybe the frequency of the wiggle is smaller than the average edge length. And so at that point, the finite element method kind of breaks down. Yeah? So it's very typical to take this sequence and just cut it off. Yeah? Um, and so as a, as a descriptor, this is an extremely easy thing to compute, right? What do you do? You, com you construct the Laplacian matrix. You compute its eigenvectors. That's it. That's your descriptor, right? Because remember that a single eigenvector is one number per vertex, right? So if I make those into a matrix, right, where every column is a different eigenvector, and I just read it row by row, <laughs> each row is a descriptor of each vertex. Yeah? So literally, it's just one line of code. 
Yeah? Uh, and, and, and the global uh, point signature actually has a really nice uh, theorem attached to it, which is that if your surface doesn't self-intersect, neither does the GPS embedding. This is a great usage of some of the terminology we've already introduced in our, our lecture. A different way of thinking about descriptors is that they're an embedding into another space. Do you see that? Because for every point on the surface, is mapping it into r to the number of eigenvectors. Right? So this is like just a weird piece of geometry in some high dimensional space. Does that picture make sense? It's worth kind of sitting back for a second. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, yeah, so, so the question was, how, uh, so, so some way to, one way to view it is like, how many eigenvectors do I compute, right? Because like, what is the dimensionality of this, this embedding? Like my surface sat in R3, in theory this embedding is into L infinity, right? It's into sequences of, of numbers because it's an infinite number of vibration modes. Yeah? Um, you're absolutely right. For these theories to hold, you really need the infinite sequence. Um, in fact, typically the theorems are about the smooth case, they're not about the discrete case. Um, in practice, what do we do? Yeah, about a hundred. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, no, they, they, you're absolutely right, and this is a parameter of these algorithms that, that, that's worth choosing carefully, which is sort of the dimensionality of the embedding. Obviously, if you don't have very many, it's, it's very low frequency, it's not very sensitive. If you have too many, it gets it's sensitive to noise. Um, so what do we do? We cross-validate, yeah? We do all of our favorite machine learning things uh, here. Uh, to choose parameters. Or if you're in graphics, you just choose one and then say in the footnote of your paper, like, we took n to be 200. Um, but that's shameful. You shouldn't do that. Okay, but, but in any event, uh, the, the basic theory here uh, is that for one thing, the, the, if the surface doesn't self intersect, neither does the GPS embedding, what does that mean? That means a different way of putting it is that every point gets a unique signature. Yeah? Does that make sense? And furthermore, what happens if my surface, I take a Homer and I, I deform him isometrically? Well, every point has the same signature. <laughs> yeah? So what if I want, I have Homer Simpson and he's probably not running laps. I feel like that's not a very Homer Simpson thing to do. He's, he's walking to the donut thing. Um, then what can I do if I want to match points on one Homer to points on another? It's, it's quite simple. I just compute the GPS signature for every point on the surface. And then it's just find the closest point in, the GP in all the GPS signatures for the points on the other surface. Right? So I've taken this potentially complicated mapping problem and reduced it to just find the closest guy in the, in the other embedding. Notice I couldn't have done that with the embedding in R3, right? Because like I, maybe Homer fell over and rotated 90 degrees. All the vertices changed position, right? It looks globally completely different. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, the, uh, so this, this property one. Um, by the way, the, uh, proving this theorem is quite simple. Uh, the way that you do it, uh, Laplacian eigenfunctions, like the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator span the set of all functions on a surface. Kind of know that from Fourier. So what would it mean if two points had the same GPS embedding? It would mean all functions on the surface have to have that value <laughs> at that point. I can't, I can't, right, those points always have the same value. And that, that doesn't make any sense. So there's a, there's a contradiction there. Okay, uh, and similarly, an even easier uh, thing to prove here is that it's isometry invariant, and, and it's a one-liner because it comes from the Laplacian. Laplacian is isometry invariant. Um, okay, um, the GPS has some, some drawbacks. That's why uh, there's been lots of literature uh, since 2007. Um, in particular, these theories uh, break down if, if there's a repeated eigenvalue. Um, how common do you think repeated eigenvalues are? You're wrong. They're extremely common. The reason being that, okay, well, what was our motivation? It was humans. And humans have a left-right symmetry. Yeah? So for every eigenfunction that's like big on one hand and small on the other, I can flip the whole thing and get a second eigenfunction with the same eigenvalue. Yeah? Uh, and so this is actually a big problem. <laughs> um, and so that, and, and, and in addition to that, there's a potential for eigenfunction switching. This is an interesting phenomenon, which says that maybe I deform Homer a little bit, but not quite isometrically, so the eigenfunctions change a little bit. And, and take a look. So like, for example, this eigenfunction knows about his feet, and this one knows about his hands. <laughs> They're like sort of orthogonal to each other, right? And every once in a while, so the eigenvalues are changing a little bit because Homer's deforming, and, and these aren't quite the same. And every once in a while, they change order, and then this entire embedding just looks different. <laughs> That's a big issue. This is called switching. Yeah? Uh, 
Uh, fairly robust. In fact, people have used it for what they call symmetry detection, which is, is looking for these intrinsic kind of symmetries to the surface, and they, they work pretty well. Yeah, it's a good question, though. Uh, and then the final thing is that these are extremely non-local features, right? Like, you notice that the vibration mode knows about the whole surface all at one time. Yeah. Okay, uh, so there, there are many different um, things you can cook out of Laplace operator. They just give you different descriptors on a surface. Um, and they all have a similar set of theorems attached to them, but then in practice they're quite different in, in their application. Right, so all of them are isometry invariant, distinguished points are kind of stable to noise. Um, a different one is to go back to that heat diffusion picture that I drew you before. Right, we didn't go there, we didn't, notice GPS didn't quite carry that out, right? It was vibration modes. We could ask, could we do something similar but with heat? And the answer is yes. Uh, and this object um, is called the heat kernel signature. Uh, of course, uh, unsurprisingly, shortly after the heat kernel signature was proposed, there was another one called the wave kernel signature, because, you know, they, I don't know, Poston has a lot of PDE associated to it, we might as well throw spaghetti at the wall. Um, and, and essentially, the, the high level uh, point of these descriptors, we'll cover in more detail in a second, is to use this sort of behavior of a physical system to characterize a shape. Yep. And whether that uh, physical system is waves propagating along a surface or heat diffusing, um, is, that's more of an engineering decision because the theory attached to those two is, is roughly the same. Uh, so remember we talked all the way, what, two, three lectures ago about the fact that if we know the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, we can actually solve the heat equation in closed form. I think we did the wave equation. The heat equation is kind of similar. Remember how this goes? So I can take any function on my surface and just write it in this basis. Yeah? And then when I do that, uh, one thing that we can see is that to solve the heat equation, you just stick an e to the minus lambda in front of the coefficients. This, this makes sense? This is something we already covered. If it doesn't, you should go back because this is like a key mathematical technique, never mind all this cool fancy geometry stuff we're doing. Um, but in any event, uh, what does that mean? That means that sort of if we know Laplace and eigenfunctions, we also know how to think about heat diffusion. Uh, and indeed, uh, one of the, the cool uh, signatures people propose is like the, called the heat kernel signature, HKS. So, so let's take a look at this formula. What, what is this formula doing? Um, so this K sub T notation is something called the heat kernel. And this is the amount of, so K sub T of X comma Y is the amount of heat that diffuses from X to Y in time T. Okay, does that make sense? And just by reading off the, that eigenvalue formula we had before, uh, it's, it's, it's quite simple. It's just like phi of x, and then there's a phi of y, and then an e to the minus eigenvalue hiding in there. Okay? Um, so what I've shown you here is the diagonal of the heat kernel. So how do I interpret this object as a function of t for a fixed x? Let's think about it for a second. So what that is, is I put a little pinprick, I put a delta function of heat at some point on the surface, and then I just let it evolve over time. I just let it diffuse out. Okay? And I put a temperature probe right where I put that, that the heat. And nowhere else. I actually don't know anything about the heat anywhere else on the surface. Okay? And I just sit there and I measure the temperature as it evolves over time. Okay? So if I have, let's see here, if I have a really tight spherical object, what's going to happen? Well, very quickly, the heat's going to diffuse out, right? It's going to go to its neighbors. And this is going to kind of level out and be flat. If I have a hyperbolic system, then it might be a little slower before it does that because it takes longer for the heat to get out. Yeah? Yes? Exactly. So, so at, at time zero, I just happen to know the distribution of heat over the whole surface, and then I just let it go. Um, the, other, the other question you should ask about boundary conditions is directly or Neumann, like do I attach a refrigerator to the side of my, my uh, surface or do I just let it, you know, in the words of Elsa, just let it, let it go? Uh, and the answer is actually it doesn't matter. This, this, for this theory, either one will, will work. Um, yeah, so, uh, right, so, so the heat, right, the heat, the heat kernel is the amount of stuff that goes from every x to every y. By the way, this is a positive definite kernel in, in machine learning, you can use this for, for kernel methods, like SVM. Um, but if I diagonalize it, I just look at x comma x, I've thrown away information. Do you see that? Like, because I don't know, you know, the, the amount of heat that went from my hand to my forehead, all, forehead. all I know is uh, the amount that stayed at one point. Yeah? So if I think of the kernel as a matrix, this is just this diagonal. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so why do we like this as a descriptor? Well, take a look. For every point x on my surface, I've now associated to it a function over the, the positive real line. Yeah? This is kind of an interesting description. It takes my, my, my surface and lists it into L2 of, of, of the positive numbers. Does that make sense? This is a very redundant descriptor. I have a three-dimensional three surface. I'm lifting into infinite dimensional space. Um, first of all, is this thing computable? Yeah, it's actually pretty easy to approximate. Do you see that? Because what do I do? I, I compute the eigenfunctions or some sequence of eigenfunctions of, of my Laplace operator, and I just plug into this formula. Now, remember that I can't compute all the eigenvalues, <laughs> yeah? But there's a really nice thing that happens with heat kernel signature. Do the big eigenvalues matter? No, right? Because look, there's an e to the minus eigenvalue factor here, right? So that term pretty much goes to zero extremely quickly, and what's left are just the first few uh, eigenfunctions. So it's actually perfectly reasonable to uh, truncate in this case. Yep. Um, in fact, actually, a weirder question to ask is what the limit of this function looks like as t goes to zero. And then there's all kinds of crazy, like, zeta function style arguments you have to use to, to, to think about this thing. Um, but in any event, as t gets big, it's, it's easy, it's just diffusive. And um, it looks something like this. So here we have this, this uh, dragon thing. Uh, and, and we've highlighted four points. So points one and two are on his front, front toes. And points three and four are on his back toes. And notice that the, the dragon has roughly a left-right symmetry, to go back to the question you had before. So we expect the heat kernel signature of these two points to be the same. You see that? And indeed, when I plot it, take a look at what happens. So this is the heat kernel signature as a function of time. And you can see that very roughly it clusters into two pieces. If you're really good, you can eyeball which ones are which. I can't, uh, by the way. So one and two are, are the, the front feet. If you have a good intuitive explanation why, I'd be curious to hear. Maybe because it's closer to his head and that's kind of spherical. I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but in any event, the, the thing you should get out of this plot is that the, the two plots cluster together, so it's detecting the left-right symmetry of the surface, but not exactly, right? One and two are a little bit different. It makes sense, because this guy is, is not 100% symmetric. That makes sense, how you would use this thing? So you would compute this plot for every point on the surface, and then to compare points, you're comparing these, these plots. Okay? So, right, there are many properties of heat kernel signature that we, we, we know and love. Um, again, it comes from the Laplace operator, so it's isometry invariant. It's sort of multi-scale, so the heat kernel, well, it has that time variable, and in some sense, that's kind of controlling the size of the neighborhood that the heat kernel cares about. Right, so if you only care about local features, maybe you truncate t to a smaller number, I see ya. Uh, and, and, and if I care about the whole surface, then I, I use larger t. And in fact, there are, are research papers out there on partial matching, like maybe I chop off my head and I want to match it to someone else's, but I have their whole body. I have to be a little bit careful using HKS because the heat can diffuse over the whole body. So maybe I just kind of truncate it to small time. Um, it's not subject to switching because notice now I'm taking a sum over all the eigenfunctions. Uh, so sort of a combined together similar eigenvalues, so like it just doesn't matter anymore. Um, and it's relatively easy to compute. Uh, there's also, I refer, I'll refer you to the paper, there's actually a formula, if you take a limit as t goes to zero, well this thing starts to look like a delta function, so some pretty crazy stuff happens, but if you normalize the right way, you actually will get Gaussian curvature out, um, so there's actually a connection to uh, the classical stuff you've already learned. Okay, you had a, a question? Uh, mm -hmm. Fabulous. Okay. Um, Okay, so these are, are good properties, of course, for every uh, set of good properties is a bad one. Um, when you have repeated eigenvalues, then you no longer have switching problems, but you do just have multiple points that can get the same signature. Um, depending on what research paper you read, that's either a bug or a feature, right? If you care about symmetry detection, it's a feature, right? Because it means both hands ended up in the same point in your embedding space. Um, but if I want to distinguish your left side from your right side, I, I can't do it using uh, uh, these kinds of techniques. Yep. Um, and the other issue, uh, for the mathematicians in the room, actually there's a lot of really great open questions hiding here. Um, the theory that us lame geometry people can prove in the applied side is that all of these properties are true in the iso isometric case. One question you might ask is, as I deform the surface slowly, like in an elastic fashion, I, I introduce some, some non-isometric deformation, which of these measurements are stable and which ones aren't, and in what regime are they stable? Um, and, and this is something that isn't super well understood.
Uh, and in fact, uh, the empirical observation is it's very easy to break uh, these algorithms by just introducing, like, taking one vertex and scooting it away from the surface far enough, um, which is not a good property to have. So uh, shortly after the, so the, the heat kernel signature makes a lot of sense. It's easy to describe intuitively. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, people propose a wave kernel signature. I'm not going to attempt to go over it in much detail. It's just some other formula in terms of Laplace and eigenfunctions. Um, in their case, they use the kind of Schrodinger wave equation. So there's imaginary numbers that show up. Um, and they measured the energy levels uh, instead of the heat diffusion uh, behavior, which is kind of strange. Um, my impression is that this is largely kind of engineered as they go. Like, they, I don't know, you can throw any PDE you want at the Laplace and get a signature out of it. Um, one of the kind of interesting things uh, empirically is that for whatever reason, the wave kernel signature is a little more discriminative. 